Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Cyber Tank Variety Show. I am your host today, Colin Knopschman. I'm the operations manager at the tank and the host of the approximately monthly series for your information, which is in its is going into its eighth iteration next month. For your information is a series we do approximately once every month. Uh, it uh, is a series of four-ish minute presentations. Um, by folks who have a, a lot of niche in interests, who have things that they really want to want to discuss for about four minutes. It's like the kind of thing that maybe you want to blab about at a party, but don't want to blab about at a party for fear of scaring everyone away. Uh, for your information is the space to talk about all of those things. So we started the series um, last year, I think it was May 2019, back in the tank's physical space. We did two of them, one last year, and then I think one in February of this year. Then, of course, the pandemic hit. And we've been doing one pretty much every month since then online. Uh, so today you are going to be seeing a couple, uh, seven exactly, performances, uh, seven pieces from various of the past uh, 4YIs. Um, and I'll also tell you more during the show about how you can get involved in a future 4YI and including uh, mentioning when the next 4YI is taking place. It's going to be in December, so stay tuned to hear more about that. We're going to start things off here uh, with a piece from 4YI uh, 4, which was, this would have been back in probably May or June. Uh, this is a piece by Kevin Ritter about Euclidean zoning. Uh, all of these pieces, uh, ostensibly all of these are supposed to be four minutes or less. I think all of them are actually over four minutes. So, you know, we do what we can. But uh, please enjoy Kevin Ritter's piece on Euclidean zoning. Um, so, hello. Um, I'm here to talk about a 1926 Supreme Court case called Euclid v. Ambler. Um, it's where we got um, the concept of Euclidean zoning in the United States. Um, which allows um, municipalities to create zoning restrictions like um, allowing only single family homes with like three acre lots um, or other similar restrictions. It's essentially a question of what buildings can go where, um, how tall buildings can be, what they can be used for, all th that sort of stuff. Um, it can do things like stop a large factory from being built next to an elementary school or stop a skyscraper from being built next to a strawberry farm or something. Um, the case um, we're looking at took place in Euclid, Ohio in the 1920s. Um, Euclid is an inner ring suburb in Cleveland, um, which in the 1920s was a bustling city, uh, largely due to its steel mills. Um, Euclid at this time was a fairly affluent suburb, and in the 1920s, it was home to what was called Millionaire's Row along Euclid Avenue. Um, in, in this time period, the residents of Millionaire's Row caught wind that a man named Ambler had purchased a large lot across the street from their houses and planned to build a factory there. Uh, the residents of Millionaire's Row pre were predictably perturbed by this potential factory for obvious reasons. They thought like the fumes could make people sick, um, but perhaps more importantly, they were worried that their property values could plummet. So they implemented zoning that uh, privileged uh, single family homes above all others, and they zoned Ambler's property to not allow a factory to be built on that lot. And that's essentially what Euclidean zoning is, zoning that privileges detached single family homes. So Mr. Ambler decided to take this to the courts and the case worked its way up between 1922 um, to the Supreme Court in 1926. Um, Ambler claimed that he should be able to put whatever he wanted on his land and to that to restrict what he could put there represented a taking. And so it was here at the Supreme Court that things got kind of really interesting because although the original case hinged primarily on putting factories near houses, much of the discussion in, in the Supreme Court case surrounded another threat, that of the apartment building. Uh, there was concern that apartment buildings would loom over single family homes, depriving them of light and air. Uh, the Supreme Court decision even calls apartment houses a mere parasite. Uh, like they're somehow leaching resources off of precious low-rise neighborhoods and polluting them. 
Um, but as you may have thought about already, conversations about what buildings are permissible are often like a stand-in for what kinds of people should be able to inhabit spaces. As much as the inhabitants of Millionaire's Row were concerned about factories pollution and the potential for increased traffic into the neighborhood, they were also concerned about the factory bringing in the kinds of people who labor in factories, namely black workers and Eastern European workers who would cross the Cleveland Euclid border and invade their neighborhood. Um, apartment buildings too represented a threat to the affluent white suburban family homeowners. If poor apartment dwellers could come into the neighborhood, what would that mean for them? Would there be more crime? Would it ruin the neighborhood? So exclusionary zoning is as much about excluding people as it is about preventing certain buildings from being built in a neighborhood. Um, recently, some cities like Minneapolis and Seattle are contending with single family zoning's racist history and co considering ending such restrictions in an effort to create more equitable and affordable housing. Um, there's some potential problems with how this is being implemented, but I've got like seconds left, so we're not going to go into the, that. Um, so thank you for coming to my little chat about this Supreme Court case and basically how one wealthy community in suburban Ohio in the 1920s set the stage for a century of discriminatory housing and urban planning policies throughout the country. Um, thanks so much. Hey, welcome back. Uh, we are going to jump right from uh, Kevin's piece there, which was about uh, borders and zoning, into a border of a different kind, a time border. This is from Pat Dunning. Uh, I think my friend Sam is watching this, and it's his birthday. So happy birthday to you, my friend. All right. All right. Ready to go. Go for it. OK. Um, what were you doing on December 30th, 2011? Um, at the time, I was like a senior in high school. I would have been on my winter break, gearing up for a New Year's party the next day, something like that. Um, but if you were, if you happen to be a resident of Samoa, the island nation in Oceania, northeast of Australia and New Zealand, if you were to say anything about what you did on December 30th, 2011, you would be lying because the island nation of Samoa did not have a December 30th, 2011. In fact, around Mid 2000s, Samoa announced its plan to transition itself across the international date line, switching from being basically the very last country on the globe to begin a calendar day to being one of the first. One minute after 11.59 p.m. on Thursday, December 29th, the clocks changed and it became 12 a.m. midnight at the beginning of Saturday, December 31st. Now, Samoa, of course, did not move anywhere geographically. It's an island. It stayed in place and got permission, I guess, to bend the international dateline just a little bit to the east, just enough to shift the official time zone of Samoa while leaving American Samoa, which is only 30 miles east of the Samoan Islands, back in the previous day. When Samoa jumped ahead in time to December 31st, American Samoa began December 30th. To pilot a boat 30 miles from one island to the other now takes you back in time. Now, why would a nation do this? For Samoa, it was an economic decision, mostly. Samoa does a lot of business with Australia and New Zealand, which were a day ahead of Samoa before the shift. So before the shift, if you sent your Samoan emails to Australia on your Friday, they're already on their Saturday, their weekend. And then when they email you back on their Monday, it's still weekend for you in Samoa because it's Sunday. So the time shift was a plan to make business easier. And this is not the first and only time this kind of time shift has happened. A country can do it for political reasons. Spain switched its time zone up an hour forward in 1941 as a gesture of solidarity from Francisco Franco to Adolf Hitler. Crimea voted to join Russia in 2014 and shifted its time zone two hours forward to line up with Moscow. In 2015, North Korea adopted what it called Pyongyang time and set its clocks back half an hour to reflect on the time before the Japanese colonization. So political, reasons. And, you know, in fact, the concept of standardized time zones really only emerged in the 1800s when train travel was booming. You know, we were familiar with these 25 clean and tidy strips of time across the globe latitudinally or longitudinally 
But that was very much spearheaded by the United States and the United Kingdom, these Western powers. The UK made Greenwich Mean Time. Um, Canada invented Daylight Savings Time in 1884. But if you look at an actual map of what time zones different countries obey, it looks much different. You know, in fact, eight countries on this planet have a single unified time zone across them. 40% of the world lives in those countries. There's a 47 mile strip of the world where Afghanistan borders China. And that strip has a three and a half hour time difference. Nepal has a two hour, 15 minute time difference from China to its north and a 15 minute time difference from India to its south. And there are a bunch of Central American countries that use a time zone one hour earlier than South American countries to their east and Mexico to their west. It's arbitrary as all hell. So ultimately, it doesn't feel that weird that one country would want to shift things and skip a day to simplify its economy. In fact, there was actually some people near the start of the new millennium who tried developing an entirely new time system. In 1998, MIT's Media Lab and the Swatch Company teamed up to develop something called Swatch Internet Time, a unified time zone based on a thousand beats per day, a new framework for time that acknowledged that our interconnected world would technically exist all at one single time. But it never ended up catching on though, because ultimately we're still animals and we all like to sleep when it's dark out and wake up when the sun's out. Thank you. Amazing, thank you, Pat. Uh, speaking of it being dark out, it being cold out, the sun being out, the sun being down, Let's move over to a presentation from Talia uh, about the most haunted painting ever. There are apparently a lot of haunted paintings out there, but I'm going to tell you about why Man Proposes, God Disposes by Edwin Lanzer fits the definition better than most. All three definitions, actually. I'm going to work backwards. Definition number three, disturbed, distressed, worried. Sir Edwin Lanzer was early mid-Victorian Britain's foremost animal painter. He was a great favorite of Queen Victoria, and reproductions of his work were popular across social classes. He painted so many dogs that there is actually a breed of dog named after him. Sadly, starting with a major nervous breakdown in his late 30s, Lanzer dealt with recurring and worsening bouts of depression and paranoia, exacerbated by drug and alcohol abuse. He was eventually institutionalized a year before his death in 1873. As you might expect, Man Proposes is not the only dark work from the second half of his life. When he painted it, he was also in the middle of a difficult project that would become perhaps his greatest legacy, the lion statues at Trafalgar Square. Here's a sketch he made that year with the label, My Last Night's Nightmare. Haunted indeed. Okay, definition number two. Preoccupied as with an emotion, memory, or idea. Obsessed. It's not necessarily obvious to the modern viewer, but Man Proposes has a specific subject and one that really haunted Victorian society. This was Franklin's lost expedition. In 1845, the ships HMS Terror and HMS Erebus, under the command of explorer Sir Don Franklin, set out for the Northwest Passage, a famously unnavigated and much desired sea shortcut from Europe to Asia. The 129 men never returned. This had been a major imperial undertaking, led by a national hero, and people became desperate for answers. Ultimately, 36 separate expeditions would participate in the search between 1848 and 1880. This was largely due to the efforts of Franklin's wife, Jane, Lady Franklin, through a combination of fundraising, political and social influence, and a huge amount of PR. Franklin and his men were celebrated in monuments, literature, theater, music, and of course, various kinds of visual art as embodiments of Victorian values, nation, and empire. This became an issue in 1854, when Scottish explorer John Ray actually talks to the local Inuit, radical idea, and is able to be like, hey, it's pretty clear everyone is dead, and also there are credible reports of cannibalism. Sidebar, they're true. Lady Franklin and the Admiralty and the public all freak out. Everyone eventually settles into denial and also racism towards the Inuit. The surges continue. In 1859, Naval Officer Francis McClintock leads the most fruitful expedition yet. His account of it was so popular that there was eventually a children's edition. He's like, hey, so they definitely are all dead. But turns out Franklin died before this non-cannibalism that was actually maybe just the wild animals we saw. Also, they did successfully complete the Northwest Passage. Sidebar, this is not true. But armed with better facts, everyone starts enthusiastically mourning, which is still the case in 1864, when man proposes debuts in a prime spot at the Royal Academy's major annual summer exhibition. Lady Franklin pretty understandably refuses to look at it. It was generally popular and largely praised, but was also subject to much criticism. Other contemporary paintings referenced the expedition, but didn't get the controversy. Lanzer does actually hew quite closely to McClintock's accepted report, but doesn't valorize or try to justify Franklin's crew, mission, or nation. 
They're all just fodder for hungry bears. And counterintuitively, people actually saw those bears as a reference to the cannibalism that was too existentially, existentially offensive to even contemplate. This may or may not have been Lanzier's in intention. Either way, when people are that haunted by something, they'll see it everywhere. Definition number one, inhabited or frequented by ghosts. In its modern day life, Man Proposes has gained fame as a haunted painting. In 1881, it was bought by philanthropist Thomas Holloway, founder of Royal Holloway College, which was then a women's college and is now part of the University of London. It hangs there today. According to legend, it can make people crazy and or fail their exams. The story goes that in the 1920s or 30s, a student who looked directly into the bear's eyes went mad and committed suicide after writing, quote, the polar bears made me do it on her incomplete test. By the, by the 1970s, a student straight up refused to sit in front of it at exam time, and the first thing found to cover it was a giant Union Jack. It is still used to, hang, to cover the painting during exams today. Haunted artist, haunted society, haunted painting, not a coincidence. The phrase man proposes, God disposes is a biblical proverb, meaning man makes plans, but God decides what happens. In broader terms, people are ultimately powerless against larger forces, forces like nature, starvation, mental illness, and even college exams. Despite being an artistic achievement, so much about this painting concerns human failure, impotence, and even irrelevance. It's well, pretty haunting. Hey, welcome back. Uh, that was Talia Feldberg's uh, The Most Haunted Painting Ever from Four Year Information 5. And before that, we had Pat Dunning's um, presentation about the International Dateline from the third uh, Four Year Information, which would have been the first Four Year Information that we did online back in April or May, I think. If this is a thing that is exciting to you, if you are interested yourself in presenting for about four minutes on some topic that you just really want to talk about, you are welcome to shoot me an email. My email address is colin at the tank nyc.org. Um, shoot me an email, just give me your name, and I will add you to our list and uh, get you on a list so that you can sign up to be in the next one. When is the next four-year information, you ask? My great question. It is going to be 9.30 p.m. Eastern time on Friday, December 18th. Uh, so we're skipping November here. We're doing our next one in December. I'll put that up. I'll mention that again later. But for now, let's jump on to the next presentation. And next, we are going to be hearing from Aaron Linker from 4YI6 back in September. Uh, here's Aaron. So today I will be talking about the female dick, uh, a, a dive into the intriguing world of the pseudo phallus. Uh, this is a biological structure which we have discovered in at least 12 different animal species spanning mammals, birds, and insects. Uh, and if you're like most people, you're probably thinking, whoa, what did I get myself into here? Don't worry, this will be intriguing and it may help even dispel some myths on how evolution operates and how certain traits are selected for in natural selection. It is going to feature talk about genitalia and pictures. And if you'd rather not see that or hear about it, I totally get it. Feel free to pop out, pop back in in about four minutes when in no doubt someone more intelligent and more handsome than me is gonna be presenting. Okay, so without further ado, let's take a look at what we're dealing with here and really, really gird yourselves here. This is gonna be a real shock. Oh my goodness, it looks like a penis. Can you believe it? Uh, all right, everybody get out from under their desks now. It just looks like a penis, that's the point. Um, this is a female spotted hyena and you can see she's sporting a pseudo phallus. Uh, it's called a pseudo phallus because it doesn't function like a typical penis in that it can't transport sperm out of the body and into another because females don't produce sperm in general. Uh, in the case of mammals like our hyena here, typically the pseudo phallus is actually an engorged clitoris. As you can see, it's a really brilliant resemblance. Try to see if you can tell which one of these is the male and the female. I'll give you about 10 seconds to guess. Okay, time's up. Uh, it was female on the left, male on the right. Uh, if you couldn't get it, don't worry. Scientists literally have to sedate hyenas and then prod through their genitalia with tweezers to determine the sex. It is so incredibly difficult to tell them apart. Amazing. Um, hyena society is a dominant female society with a hierarchy. You have a highest ranking female, a second highest ranking female, and so on, and then the males at the bottom. Uh, and so all of hyena society is based around female choice. Um, one more wrinkle with the spotted hyenas, there are species of primates who as a display of aggression will develop an erection. They'll go up to another male and they'll wave it around, you know, it's basically to say I'm bigger than you, I'm, I'm more loaded, check it out, you don't stand a chance. Um, and so you might assume from that that uh, when a species of animal develops an, an erection outside of a sexual situation, it is only for uh, a display of aggression, not the case with the spotted hyena. In fact, uh, uh, 
when a male is terrified because a high-ranking female is bullying him and making his life miserable and taking his food, he develops an erection, not as an aggressive display, but as a submissive gesture, basically saying, hey, don't mess with me. I'm just a dude. I don't mean you any harm. You go worry about the other high-ranking females. Interestingly, we see the same thing among the females of the spotted hyenas. The pseudophallus will develop an erection as a means of submission. If a higher ranking female is coming down on a lower ranking female, harassing them, bullying them, the lower ranking female will develop an erection to say, don't worry about me, I'm just a guy, no worries. Um, very, very awesome animals. Okay, now I wanna move on to the Neotrolga. Uh, trogla. This is a, a species of wood lice, which um, has genitalia, which is completely inverted. The male has a vagina and the female has a pseudophallus. Um, and the female uh, for copulation, there's a picture of the pseudophallus. Beautiful, isn't it? And during copulation, the female will um, inject the male with their pseudophallus and they will extract sperm from the male uh, through the, the pseudophallus, which I find very interesting. And finally, I want to talk about the cassowary, which is a really, really beautiful bird, very big, very aggressive. Um, they've, hurt a, they've hurt a number of humans, but uh, killed very few except for a Florida man in 2019. Um, they also have pseudophalluses. There's a man for, uh, for scale. Uh, they also have pseudophalluses, but, they, but both uh, sexes have a pseudophallus, both the male and the female. Um, the males is uh, uh, used primarily to sort of invert the females and then allow the real uh, reproduction genitalia, the cloaca, which is located below the base of the male phallus uh, to actually go about doing its business. Um, there it is in all its glory. Uh, and, and he's like, wow, I can't believe I have that. Uh, and there they are again. So what have we learned? The pseudophallus is a, a biological structure totally naturally evolved like every other natural structure, just another kind of evolutionary brilliance. And what we find is that no matter our expectations about how nature ought to be or should be, nature will always develop evolutionary advantages which subvert those expectations. Thank you very much. Thanks, Aaron. That was uh, from For Your Information number six. That was back in September now. Um, next up, we have a presentation by Kev Berry. This is from For Your Information number five, back in August, I believe. Um, so I'm streaming from StreamYard right now. StreamYard allows us to upload videos, but it has the technological limitation of uh, only being able to upload videos of up to five minutes. Now, if everyone followed my rules, this would not actually be a problem, but uh, unfortunately everyone goes over all the time because of course they do. Uh, Kev went over especially on this one um, and I had to trim it down. It was actually over five minutes. So I had to trim this one down a little bit um, to make it even be under five minutes. Uh, so the thing I trimmed out was Kev reading the extremely long title. I am now going to read the extremely long title to you. The extremely long title of this piece is a spectacular and visceral and extremely beautiful presentation on the television network uh, television program Chopped, which airs on Food Network and which Kev watches in bed on Hulu, which he logged into using his best friend Max's mom's login information. Okay, Daddy. Uh, I think Daddy in this case was referring to me. So, great, we love this. Uh, here is Kev's piece, please enjoy. Uh, anyway, welcome to the presentation. I'm Kev, and one thing I love a lot in this life that I've been given is as follows. I love, I love television because I'm a lazy American fag. I love yelling and I love food. That's one thing I love a lot in this life. And something else I love in this life is the television program Chop, which is now in its yes, 46th season. Hi, Megan, if you're watching. I'm not sure if you are. You didn't answer, I don't, uh, you didn't answer my text. Uh, okay, so Chopped is, and I'm sorry, to, okay, I'm sorry to say, but if you don't know what Chopped is, frankly, you don't deserve to live in a Darwinistic way. People who know what Chopped Chopped is are more fit to survive than people who don't know what Chopped is. And really, I've seen every episode of Chopped at least three times. So I'm sorry to say if I'm, I'm fitter to survive than most, which is something many gay, gay people can't say because I'm also sorry to say gay people, gay men tend to be irritating and irritating people should be laid to rest. So look, I know I'm irritating, but at least I know I would know what to do if I discovered a basket with jicama, wheat lacoche, canned pig brains, and buffalo chicken soda in the middle of the woods, all right? How do I go to the next one? Uh, I've spent a lot of time in quarantine watching the television program Chopped. I've also been watching the programs, uh, The Leftovers, Babylon Berlin, Sabora, Home of Amy Sedaris, Space Force, We're Here, Somebody Feed Phil, Central Park, Search Party. And I'm currently watching the program Pose starring Dominique Jackson. I'm very lonely. There's so many episodes of Chopped and I've watched or rewatched many of them during the global health crisis. I'm just craving human connection. Uh, who are these people? Ted Allen is the host and moderator of the program. He wears slick suits and cute sneakers. He originally garnered attention on the nationally televised act of terrorism, Queer Eye 
Drive for the straight guy. There are a whole bunch of judges, but most of them seem like they hate women and queer people. So I'll focus on my three favorites. And guess what? Two of them are. They're women. And one of them is a straight man with several kids, but he looks gay so he can stay. And the first up is Alex Farnaschelli. And she's got really bad anxiety and she owns the, the beautiful restaurant Butter in Midtown. And she's got a few cookbooks. And I like her because one time I met her and she told me the way the shirt I was wearing, she liked it with the tie I was wearing. And when I met her at a food event uh, network, I was at food, food network event that I was at where I ate approximately 70 arancini. Arancini are rice balls. That's Chef Alex. Next up is Amanda Freytag. She is obsessed with her charity, God's Love We Deliver, which helps the hungry kids. I'm obsessed with her because she always seems like she's on Quaaludes, where it's like, yes, go off, Mama, get down with your bad self on the chop shoot. This is Chef Amanda. Jeffrey Zakarian is the one who looks gay but isn't. He owns the Lambs Club and also hosts on Food Network's The Kitchen. I like him because he always seems like he's imprisoned by his contract with the network. He doesn't want to see Sandwich King Jeff Morrow's disgusting take on a mac and cheese deep fried grilled cheese. And he does not want to eat sour cream and onion potato chip ice cream some competitor on Chopped made. He wants to go home and make a light summer pasta dish for his hot wife. This is daddy. Tell me that's not a gay man. I've been watching CHOP for 11 years of my little life. These are some stats for you, David Lawson. There have been approximately 250 episodes of CHOP. That means four, that means, uh, four, four chefs, the producers cast, three rounds of regular cooking. And then there have been about 100 more spe special episodes of CHOP. This means special tournaments, horny teen chefs, or a first date. Uh, don't go on a first date and be on CHOP. That's, that's called The Bachelor. I'm not here for flirting. I'm here for dishes made with octopus pastrami and acorn squash. Here's the secret. In all my years watching CHOP, which is 11 years, and I've been sexually active for many of them, I've never hooked up with a CHOP competitor, meaning no one has ever walked on to the chopped kitchen on my screen and made me go, oh, I hooked up with him until now. This week was rough. What happened, babe? This week, two things happened to me. Uh, this week I was watching Chopped and a guy I hooked up with, uh, we went on a date to Gran Tivoli and he was kind of boring and he was a chef and the sex was okay, but the, neither the, the date nor the dinner nor the uh, nor the sex was good enough to want a second date. He was on Chopped and uh, after the first round, he winked at a, 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 a lady chef and the woman, and then he called her babe and she called him out on it. She said, this is not the 1940s. And then guess what? He made a fool of himself for the next hour and then he won. So I, Kev Berry, have fucked a Chopped champion. Uh, boy, there's more. And then this week I got home from a 17 mile bike ride and my ass is thick and my legs are sore and I got some really good news in an email and I treat myself to some Indian food. And I settled down for a long winter's nap, which means I'm gonna let my eyes glaze over to the television program and chop. And it's a special tournament, not nuns cooking Thanksgiving or father's sons jerking each other off as they make three courses. And it's a special tournament where the prelims are fry masters, grill masters, master bakers, and speed masters. And during the third heat, which was baking, I got a text from a boy I'd been seeing for the last few weeks. And guess what? He broke up with me. He broke up with me because we weren't on the same page about what we were looking for. And that's okay. Because when God chops one chef on the program chopped, she opens the basket for another. Isn't that nice? Start the clock over again, Colin. I think that's kind of a nice sentiment. When God opens one basket on the program chopped, she shops the chef for another. I think that's kind of nice. Anyway, I hope you learned something from this and you learned something from me telling my story very bravely. Chopped is my favorite television program ever and I love yelling at the television while I watch it because I do not have the physical skills to cook a perfect cock van using Welch's grapefruit in a Cornish hand in 30 minutes, but I do have the mental wherewithal to know that you shouldn't try and make a cock van in a round where the other two ingredients are lemongrass and watermelon radishes. I yell at the television when the competitors are being idiots. I don't do well when it comes to putting up with idiots, okay? It will always be there for me and it has been there for me for 11 years. It has seen me through a lot worse than one measly break up. It's a good show. Maybe you should watch it. Thank you. Venmo me for this great brave art at Kev Dashberry. Thank you. God bless you, Kev Dashberry. Thank you so much. Uh, I realize the sun's going down. It's 428 p.m. I fucking hate daylight savings time. We all do. Terrible year to have daylight savings time. Uh, I was under the impression that daylight savings time was uh, going to shift everything in the other direction, which was going to be great. It was going to be bright later. And instead, the opposite was true. Horrible system. Horrible system. Anyway, let's just jump right in here so that I'm not in the total dark by the time we get back to me again. This is from 4YI number 5, back in uh, August, I think. This is my dear friend, Abby Norley Ruggles, talking about Scott's Wikipedia. Uh, why is this not going? Hang on, sorry. Okay, so um, Scots is one of three Scottish languages, the other two being English and Scottish Gaelic. Scottish Gaelic is kind of its own thing, but Scots and modern English are very closely related and they're descended from, uh, both descended from Old English. Um, prior to uh, the unification of Scotland and England as one country, Scots and English were considered entirely separate languages, but um, after the unification, English became the language of the wealthy and privileged, and um, King James actually printed the King James Bible only in English, despite being a Scottish king. Um, so for these reasons, Scots was treated as a, a quote-unquote inferior or incorrect version of English, and was not written in formally very often. 
Um, however, despite this, there are still about 100,000 people in Scotland who list Scots as their first language. And actually the majority of modern Scottish people speak some combination of English and Scots in their daily lives. Um, so this raises the question of, is Scots a language or a dialect to a lot of people? There's an important rule to remember here in linguistics, which is that a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. What this means is that there is no actual linguistic definition that divides languages from dialects. It's almost entirely a political distinction. So a language is a dialect that has some kind of national identity or political will behind it. Uh, for example, Scots and English are mutually intelligible and they're very close, but they're about as different as sports, Spanish and Portuguese or Norwegian and Danish, and no one is asking whether those are languages. Um, Scots is also recognized as a language by the Scottish government. So onto Wikipedia, Scots Wikipedia was created in 2004 by native Scots speakers. Um, English speakers tend to find Scots funny to read because a lot of the words do look like English words, but just spelled in a heavy Scots accent. Um, so this does lead to people thinking that the wiki is a joke sometimes, which will be a recurring theme in this. Um, this actually caused problems for the wiki in 2011 when someone internally at Wikipedia proposed deleting it as a joke project, which it obviously is not. Um, in February 2013, a 12-year-old kid joined Scots Wikipedia. They were an American kid and they did not speak Scots and they still do not speak Scots to this day. However, that did not start stop them from uh, starting to create a lot of pages in Scots Wikipedia by badly translating the English pages word for word, looking up each word in a Scots dictionary and making up their own Scots versions of words if they couldn't find the English versions. Um, they created about 20,000 of these 60,000 pages currently on Scots Wikipedia. So one third of the pages are created by this one person at a rate of about eight articles per day for seven years. Uh, and in the process of doing this, they also became the sole admin of the wiki, of, of Scots Wikipedia. So they're in charge of the whole thing. So on August 25th, there was kind of an expose posted about this on Reddit. There was a lot of fallout of this. Um, a different uh, user of Scots Wikipedia revealed that there are actually no native Scots speakers in positions of power at Scots Wikipedia anymore. And the sort of general low quality of the wiki was brought to light. It's not just this one uh, well-meaning but misguided kid. There were actually a lot of people using the wiki as a joke. So this article on telekinesis was clearly an example of uh, someone just like poorly writing in English and changing the spelling around. The bottom one is that, and then the top one is someone who uh, uh, fixed it in actual Scots in the last few days. So you can see that there's a pretty significant difference between the two. Um, so currently this is all under discussion in Wikipedia um, with possibilities ranging from closing the whole project to getting a team to audit the entire thing. Um, it, it is a time sensitive issue in the sense that this is one of the, uh, the major ways that people are exposed to the Scots or like quote unquote exposed to the Scots language. And it does leave a lot of people feeling like this endangered language is a joke or not a real language. Um, this is also a broader problem with small language Wikipedias in general. Um, I want to point out that Croatian Wikipedia is also uh, controlled by a small number of people. In those case, in the, that case, they're not misguided kids. They are white supremacists. So uh, yeah, Scott, uh, Wikipedia in general needs to look out for small languages better. Thanks. Thanks, Abby. Um, great. It is almost dark here. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you just one last time here. Uh, again, this has been for your information. We got one more presentation coming to you in just a minute. But uh, if you are interested in submitting something for your own, for your information, again, you can email me. My email address is down there. The next for your information is going to be Friday, December 18th at 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. So come uh, shoot me an email. I'll uh, get you on the list. And then I'll be able I'll email everybody in probably a couple weeks to open the submissions to that. Uh, all right, we are going to jump into our final presentation. Um, this is from Gabe Palisano from For Your Information number four, which I think was June, maybe June or July. Uh, I think this is, uh, this is, might be my favorite uh, For Your Information piece of all time. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us today for the CyberTank Variety Show, Best of For Your Information. Uh, please enjoy this last one. We hope to see you here for the show again next week and for For Your Information number eight on December 18th.
please enjoy. Hi, everybody. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about the 1904 Baltic Fleet. This all takes place during the Russo-Japanese War, which was an early 20th century conflict between Russia and Japan. Uh, it's really only historically significant because it was the beginning of the end for the Russian Empire. It demonstrated that the regime was a total social, civic, economic, and political failure. Um, also, it was a shock to Europe's ego, which had quite racistly been laboring under the assumption that only they could inflict colonial atrocities on other countries, when in reality, Japan was pretty good at it too. But I'm not going to be talking about the conflict at all. I'm going to be talking about the journey that the Baltic fleet took to the Bay of Tsushima. If you look at this map, you can see that Tsushima is located here, and the Baltic fleet was anchored here. Now, a fun fact about boats back then is that they were totally incapable of overland travel, which means the route to Tsushima was, well, it was very, very long. Uh, but when the Tsar tells you you have to go die in an imperial war designed to distract from impending social collapse, you've got to answer the call. So the fleet departs in May of 1904, or actually they're going to depart in May of 1904, but while they're waiting in the harbor, the battleship Kinyaz Zivorov accidentally fires on and sinks the battleship Oryol. So they have to wait until October to depart. About a week and a half into the trip, they're in the North Sea when they come across three British fishing trawlers, and they make the same assumption that anyone would when you come across three small boats off the coast of England in the early morning that they're being attacked by the Japanese. So what happens next is the 30 minute sustained bombardment during which the Baltic fleet sinks all three vessels and just to be absolutely certain, two of their own. Uh, so obviously Great Britain is very, very upset. They're about to declare war on Russia. Uh, mercifully, diplomacy saves the day and Russia is able to prevent the Russo-Japanese war from becoming the Russo-Anglo-Japanese war by dumping a literal boatload of money into Britain's lap. But that's not the end of it because like I said, Britain is still very upset. If you return to this map of the proposed route to Tsushima, you'll see there are a few bottlenecks here, here, and here. These are respectively the Strait of Gibraltar, the Suez Canal, and the Gate of Tears, all of which incidentally are owned by Britain at the time. Hoping to spare the world's fishermen a second incident, Britain bans the Baltic fleet from passing through any of them. So now the road to Tsushima looks a little bit more like this. Uh, at Gabon, the Baltic fleet uh, almost makes the Russo-Anglo-Japanese War the Russo-Anglo-Franco-Japanese War by sailing directly into a French port to demand coal under threat of bombardment. This desperation was caused by the fact that they had missed an opportunity to resupply at Dakar because during a training exercise, one of their boats had crashed into the fuel depot and set it on fire. Speaking of training exercises, the Baltic fleet engages in several of them along the Horn of Africa, which really only succeed in exhausting their supply of ammunition when it's discovered that the battleship Oryol had never been restocked when it sank back in May. The Russian Admiralty had sent a supply vessel after them with the missing ammunition and also an experimental submarine, but the Baltic fleet had misidentified it as a Japanese sneak attack and blown it out of the water when it caught up with them near Spain. The Oriole running dry is almost a non-issue though because uh, during target practice it is hit by friendly fire and it sinks yet again. So the Baltic fleet has to anchor at Madagascar and await reinforcements and what happens next is what you might expect to happen if you took a bunch of people who had never been to the tropics, ruined them there over the summer, and made them wait in tiny metal boxes on the water. Malaria. A lot of malaria. So a bunch of people end up dying and the Baltic fleet does what any self-respecting Navy would do, they hold a funeral at sea. And like any self-respecting Navy holding a funeral at sea, they accompany it with a 21-gun salute. What only the Baltic fleet would do, though, is uh, accidentally use live ammunition for the 21-gun salute. In the ensuing carnage, two ships have been hit, um, the Aurora and, you guessed it, the Oriole. So to, uh, if you think this all sounds very ridiculous, well, so did the crew of the Oriole because they mounted an attempted mutiny about uh, two weeks later outside Vietnam. And if you think that sounds very reasonable, well, so did the rest of the Baltic fleet because there were three more mutinies the next day. To bring this all to a close, the Baltic fleet finally arrives in Tsushima in May of 1905 after eight months of journey. And there they are met by the entire Japanese Navy and the whole Baltic fleet is sunk in one of the worst disasters in modern naval history. But if it's any consolation, the battleship Oriole finds a new home in the Japanese Navy where it's renamed the Awami and it serves for 17 years without ever having to sink again. Thank you.